Ezekiel 37 is where we left off. And we made it all the way down to verse 14. So we're going to pick it up tonight in verse 15. Um, you remember the context um, for many chapters, God had been dealing with judgment towards the nations, Judah mostly, but then he also dealt with um, the other nations, Egypt and a bunch of different uh, nations that we covered. Then he went into the restoration of Israel and how he would restore the land. Son of man prophesied to the mountains, he was told, of Israel. Um, and then in chapter 37, he saw the valley of the, of the dead dry bones, remember? And God told him to prophesy to those dry bones. And remember, they weren't like in skeleton form already. They had to rattle and come back together, you know, and then have all the stuff put on them. And then they stood up and life uh, came into them. And that was a picture of him bringing the nation of Israel back to life. So that part of the uh, chapter, um, that part of it we, we see is already fulfilled. Um, May 14th, 1948, um, after about a, almost 100 years of the Zionist movement happening, um, the nation is birth. Um, and then that movement continued and continues up until right now as we speak, which is beautiful. So now we're going to look at him speaking to uni unifying the nation again. Um, and we'll talk about what that is. We'll dive back and look at some scripture, some interesting scripture I want to point out. We'll look at that. And then we'll get into chapter 38 tonight and start making some progress into that area as well. So let's read uh, verses 15, maybe down through verse 22. We'll pray and then dive in. Notice if you're with me there, say amen. amen. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, as for you, does it feel like the AC is on? Yes. Now, I don't know why the AC would be on. It's a little chilly out. Maybe we can work on it. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, as for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and I'll explain in a minute. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they will, will be one in my hand and the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Verse 22, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king, which we'll get into in a minute, shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into uh, two kingdoms again. And so, Lord, we do thank you, uh, Lord, as we approach this wonderful, ancient, glorious text that you breathe and that you moved upon a man to write. Lord, we love you for it because you're so faithful. And we see that in these pages of these chapters of Ezekiel. And so, Lord, tonight, I pray you would open it up to us that you would continue to let us learn from it and just be blessed to see what you have done. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would take all of our difficulties from this week at work and wherever we've been and that, that you would refresh us tonight, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't know if somebody can maybe stop the AC from blowing. It's a little chilly up here. <laughs> all right. So we dive in and, and what we see is God doing what he has been doing with, with Ezekiel. 
as Ezekiel has been in the camp there um, of the captives. You remember the three different waves of captivity that happened um, as they were brought captive by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. Daniel being in the first deportation, Ezekiel the second um, deportation, and then finally those who were still in Jerusalem that didn't die in the final invasion. So Ezekiel there in the camp of the captives north of the city of Babylon, and God has been speaking with him in a lot of different ways and using his life um, almost as a parable. There was a period of time where Ezekiel was mute and he couldn't speak. Um, but he had to do all of these various dramatizations. Y'all remember that from the earlier chapters? He had to portray the city of Israel. We don't know whether he drew it, carved it, or built a little architectural design, but he had to besiege it and all of that kind of stuff to show the invasion. Um, he had to dig through the wall and, 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 and go out like he was trying to escape through the wall to show how Zedekiah, uh, the vassal king of Nebuchadnezzar that was in Judah, would try to escape. And all of these different things he had to do. He had to lay on his side for a period of time and cook his food in a weird way. Y'all remember all of this stuff? All of these things. He had to be mute. His wife passed away. He wasn't able to mourn. Um, and then uh, God said when somebody would escape and come and, and they, will, they will tell you that these things have come to pass. And one came from Jerusalem and told him the exact time that the city had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar. And everybody realized that God was speaking through Ezekiel. And so now people are just watching Ezekiel. Ezekiel does weird things and they show up to see what it is, basically. And God speaks through it. They know that God is speaking through him. And so this time he's told to take these two sticks to write on one, um, Joseph and Ephraim on the, and their companions, the nations of Israel, on the other, uh, Judah or, uh, and their, their companions. And what has happened is the, the nation of Israel was split in two. Y'all remember this. And so they were split in two way back when and uh, for two reasons. And I'll tell you what they are in a minute. And God is saying, I'm going to bring them back together and one king should be over them and they should never be divided again, which is a beautiful statement because here we are. Remember, God did bring them back uh, after the 70 years of captivity. Y'all remember that. But they have never had a one king over them. They've been ruled by uh, if you remember, by Persia, by Greece, by Rome, they rebelled by rejecting their Messiah. And then they were kicked out into all of the lands of the earth again. God brought them back. And as we said earlier, 1948, made them a nation again. Now they're dwelling there as a nation. And so we see, if you will, a, a, a somewhat of a fulfillment of it in our times in that way, but there's a greater fulfillment that we're about to see in a few verses down. But first, the two reasons that they were divided is really interesting because from a practical standpoint on the ground, as we look into their history, and if you take the school, go to the school of ministry, if we want to see history, we go back into the what books? The historical books, right? So we're going to do that in a moment. And so we understand that there was this division that took place but prior to that happening, it happened because God said it was going to happen. And it was a reason why God said it was going to happen because they went into idolatry. But there's an interesting parallel and we got to look at it because I think we need to take note of why God judged them this way. Because I think that every nation should understand it because of how God views it. So what we're going to do is dive into the historical books for just a few minutes, but we call this Bible study. So turning in the pages is okay, right? So we want to go all the way back now to first Kings, which is in the heart of the historical books. And I want to show you, I think right around chapter 13 is where we might find it. And let's pray we can make it to chapter 38 tonight. Hold on, let's see where I want to be. No, we're going to go into chapter 11. All right, chapter 11, and I'm going to read a little bit. So y'all just track with me, and we're going to cover some things. This is the historical books. This is the time of the kings. And so we're going to, we're going to look through some of this stuff. And remember, if you're in a school of ministry, some of the prophecies overlap this part of history. And so we, we'll see that as we go through. But verse 26, um, then Solomon's servant Jeroboam, this is who we're going to be talking about, son of Nebat, an Ephraimite, so he's of the tribe of Ephraim, from Zeredah, 
whose mother's name was Zeruah. I'm not going to name all of these names because we, we're going to have a rough time. A widow also rebelled against the king. Now, I want to get down. Let me skip verse 27. And this is what calls him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built uh, the Milo and repaired the damages of the city of David, his father. Then uh, the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. So this guy Jeroboam is key in this story. Y'all stay with me, okay? So Solomon says, hey, you're very industrious. I'm going to make you over a lot of what's going on here. Now, now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shulamite, met him on the way and he had clothed himself with a new garment and the two were alone in the field. Then this prophet took hold of the new garment that was on him and he tore it into 12 pieces. We're going to see that these 12 pieces represent the, the 12 tribes. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself notice 10 pieces for thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon. Solomon wrote Proverbs where we are on Sunday morning. The wisest man to ever live, why is the kingdom being taken from him? And I will give 10 tribes to you. God is saying, hey, Jeroboam, I'm going to give 10 tribes out of the 12 tribes of Israel to you to rule over. I'm taking them from Solomon's rule. But he, verse 32, shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. So notice this. God says Solomon's going to going to keep some, especially Jerusalem and Judah, for the sake of David. Not for his own sake, but God had made a promise to David. And we need to remember that when we get back over into chapter 37. What we got to understand is when God says something, that's done. If he makes a promise, that's what he's going to do. And he will not go back on it, period. So even though Solomon has rebelled in going into idolatry, why did he go into idolatry? He loved a lot of foreign women that he married and they worship other gods, which we're going to see, which took his heart away. But God says, even though you've done this, I told David I was going to keep someone on the throne. So let me keep reading. Verse 33, because they have forsaken me, notice, and worship Ashtoreth. Notice she is the goddess of the Sidonians, of, the, of, of, of Sidon. We talked about this. Uh, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Melchum, the god of the people of Ammon. And have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father, David. Now, David had some issues, too, didn't he? But one thing David didn't play with. There's only one God and he's the only one we're going to worship. David might have messed up in some other areas, but there's only one God and he's the only one we're going to worship. OK, but I want you to catch this because there's this thing going on. This first goddess is, is mentioned as Ashtoreth or Ashtar. Or she actually, she's got like four or five different names depending on, on the, on the um, nation that was worshiping her. And, and she is, um, she's tied to several other gods um, like Baal and Molech. She's actually called Belit. Um, and she's almost like the wife of Baal. And it's very interesting because Baal, I'm getting ahead of myself, Baal is often portrayed, as well as Moloch, uh, are often portrayed um, with the head of a goat because the goat always represents rebellion and stubbornness. That's, that's typically what they do. And sheep, sheep are dumb and they follow, okay? <laughs> um, but the goat is always rebellious. It's kind of a, a picture of Satan. And, and, and I've, that's been my experience with goats, you know? There was this one goat in Colombia. And uh, this goat, if you jumped in, the guy who worked there would get in the pen to do something. And then when the goat would see him, he would chase him. And the guy would run and hop out the pen. And the goat would butt the, butt the thing, the, the, the gate. You know, he's just a mean goat, you know. And they always find a way to get out no matter where you put them. I don't care how good of a farmer you are, your goat is going to escape at some point. Because that's what they do. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. Um, and so these guys would always have the, the head of a goat and the body of a man. Um, and it's symbols of, of Satan. But this particular goddess, Astroth, she's always portrayed in every carving 
in every uh, portrayal over her, whether it's drawn on a cave or on a wall of the city or carved out in a pornographic way. She's always in some pornographic pose because she's the god of sex and fertility and even war. So what she does is she comes in and she basically um, seduces and corrupts a society. And she's tied with Baal and Moloch. Moloch is, is given of his hands, give me your children, sacrifice your children to me. Baal is this high deity. And so they worship these gods and they worship her with sexual immorality. And then they sacrifice the children that come from those sexual immoral, immoral relationships. And so she's, she's portrayed all over the world the same way. They even have stuff now that they're naming after her. Uh, Astoreth clothing, which is seductive, and models that they're, they're capturing this. They're like, you know, and so it's kind of weird because our nation right now is headed way in that direction. But remember, Paul says those who sacrifice to idols are sacrificing to demons. So what happens is there's this demonic spirit over this goddess Asterisk which brings sexual immorality into a land and corrupts it. And Israel got tied up in all of this stuff. Jezebel was pushing Baal worship. All of this stuff had just become a major issue within Israel. And Solomon was marrying wives that were worshiping a lot of these gods. And it corrupted even Solomon. Um, and so this prosperous nation that belonged to God went down because of this. And now, you know, the parallel is the se that sexual morality is about to ruin America. The sexual immorality, the child sacrifice, all of the degraded things that were going on in ancient times is repeating itself in our land right now and around the world. And so this is a very interesting thing to begin to look at. It's amazing how Satan doesn't have a new playbook. It's the same thing branded a different way in every nation that he destroys in this way. So this is, this is what we're saying. So God takes the kingdom from Solomon, but he leaves him a little bit just because of David. Now, what I want you to do, now that's the spiritual side of it. Now, the practical side of it is what's going to happen is that Solomon is going to die. And then Rehoboam is going to uh, want to uh, be, be made king. And then what's going to happen is Rehoboam is going to become the king after Solomon, right? Y'all with me? This is the practical side of it. And so the northern tribes of Israel, you know, all the tribes are going to come to him and they're going to say, hey, you know, your dad Solomon taxed us really heavy. Would you mind now, since you're the new king, reducing our taxes a little bit? We would appreciate that. And then we'll serve you. Everything's cool. And so what he said is, well, go away from me for three days and then come back and I'll have an answer. So what, what uh, Rehoboam does is he consults the wise men, the elders that surrounded Solomon for counsel. What should I do? They said, well, you know, we, we have everything we need. We don't actually need the level of tax revenue that's coming in. So basically, why don't you just heed what they're saying and they will serve you faithfully. If you, if you give them a little something, then you basically will have their support. As long as you're king, he didn't like that. So he got his homeboys that he grew up with and said, what do you guys say? And they said, man, look, you tell them that your little finger is going to be bigger than your father's thigh and waist. And that if he taxed you like this and you're going to tax them even higher, you let them know who's boss, uh, 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 you know, red bone. <laughs> he liked that. So they came back in three days and he did that. He says, you think my father taxed you? I'm about, to, I'm about to tax you even higher. And the people says, you know what? Forget you. <laughs> Everybody to their own tent, Israel. We have no, no part with Judah. And so what happened is Jeroboam, who had fled the country because Solomon heard that the prophet had pronounced that he would get the kingdom, Solomon tried to kill him. So he had fled the country. They brought him back and they made him king over the northern tribes. And from that time on, Israel was divided. You follow what I'm saying? Um, so God did it. He caused it all to happen. And I'm trying to get you to see the, the, the scene here. There's two things happening at once and often we can miss them. The kingdom was divided. And if you're looking at the, the earthly scene, you can say it was divided over the pride that uh, Rehoboam had and their names sound alike. So I'm saying two different guys. If you're new to the Bible, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, I want you to read it all in your own time. 
And you can see that. But basically, God is saying no because the nation has become corrupt. Therefore, I'm doing this. I'm causing this to happen because this nation has departed from me and they have gone after all of these idols. And so God judged the nation as we go back over. So what he's saying to Ezekiel now is he's saying, Ezekiel, when I bring them back, I want you to show that I'm going to take the, that division and I'm going to put it back together and never again will it be divided. You catch that? And I'm going to put one king over them. And I want you to understand that things happen practically on the ground, but it happens on the ground because there was a decision made in heaven. And that's for everything. You know, man has no control over your life or my life or any nation. Ultimately, God has a plan and he's the one making decisions. And I'll tell you this. I saw that happen at work, too. Many times, because I know it's the middle of the week. I saw it happen on the job many times. It didn't matter what the boss or any coworker said or even a customer. It, what, what, what decisions were made in heaven while I was on my knees. And I saw that, man. God is good. Amen. So when we think about these things, we got to catch both scenes as we go through this. Now, going back over here. So God is saying, I'm bringing them back together and never again shall they be divided. But remember, he said one king should be over them. Did y'all catch that? Well, let's see what that looks like. Verse um, 23. They shall not defile themselves anymore, this is important, with their idols, nor with their detestable things. And we can read through this very fast, and we can we cannot consider what he's talking about. All of these idols. Now, wait a minute. What idols? What detestable things? Well, you gotta remember back when God was calling them out. Y'all gotta remember, I don't want to rehearse these things. I'm glad the kids ain't in here because the week that we went through some of that stuff, they were in here. <laughs> and God was, he was painting some pretty graphic pictures of what they were doing. They were making these idols um, and they were even making um, toys with some of these carvings of these idols and they were committing immorality with this stuff. I mean, y'all, I mean, I'm just being real. I mean, God was saying that y'all, y'all were, he said, y'all are worse than the other nations that y'all got this stuff from. This is what he was calling them out for. He says, so never again will these things happen nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places, meaning all of the nations in the world that they were carried away captive, which really hints towards beyond the Babylonian captivity to the, to the final exile in AD 70 when Rome destroyed the city and the temple. And he says, which they have sinned and will cleanse them, then they shall be my people and I will be their God. And then notice verse 24, which we referenced a few weeks ago. He says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now remember, because we're going to get into this a lot for the rest of the night. Remember, you know, Bible interpretation. We take it literally unless there's a reason not to. So some people don't hold to good Bible interpretation. So they automatically will spiritualize this verse to say, well, this means something else. But God just said, David. Now, remember at this time, David is where? He's, he's physically dead. He's in Abraham's bosom. He's with the saints, okay, of God. But God is saying, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. Now, we talked about this weeks ago, so I won't go through all of this. But later in the book, we're actually going to see when Jesus returns and he establishes his kingdom. Remember, he comes back. Zechariah says he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and the mountain splits. And there's a, a topographical change of the, of the land of Israel. It won't look like it looks now. It will be done over. Jesus will, will build a temple. There will be water that will flow, which we'll see later in the book, from that temple. And it will be like a Garden of Eden effect because it will heal all the, the waters on all the earth that has been poisoned during the tribulation. The land will be healed. Jesus will rule from there. And David will be the prince over Israel. Jesus will be the king over the world it's a beautiful thing why because God made David a promise ain't that something David David gets to hang out with his offspring Jesus if you will in the flesh his Lord in the spirit 
for a thousand year millennial reign from the earth. We're going to see it as we get later into the book of, of Ezekiel. So it's going to be beautiful. Then they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, uh, they, their children, their children's children forever. Remember, the millennia is going to last for a thousand years, then eternity comes. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So he is speaking of the David that we know and we read of. He's going to raise David up in the resurrection to fulfill this role there under Jesus, of course, um, as Jesus is king of, of, of all at that point. And so the millennium, as we look at the temple later in this, this book, chapters 40 through the end of the book, the millennium is going to be very interesting because there's going to be a lot going on there that maybe you don't expect. Like every year, all of the nations of the world will go there and worship. Um, and there will be some of the feasts that will be kept. And um, it's going to be just an amazing time. We might look at some of it a little bit later on. He says, uh, moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever, meaning the, this, this temple there will be there forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Um, did you catch that? I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. My tabernacle also will be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hint, Revelation 21 a little bit. We see that too. The nations also will know that I am the Lord and, and they will go. They will go to see Jesus. Sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. And I like that. So God has an eternal plan for the nation of Israel. Now remember, God's plan for Israel does not in any way conflict with his plan for the church, nor does God's plan for the church in any way conflict with what he's planning to do for Israel. And in fact, all of the Old Testament prophets didn't quite fully get all of that because remember the New Testament says that the church was a mystery to them. So when they were writing, they were never really thinking about us to begin with. They were writing um, mostly focused on God's plans for Israel. And so this is God's plan. He's going he's gonna to like dead, dry bones that cannot live. He's going to make a nation that was dead live once again. We talked about that last week, and he's already done that part. He's going to make them one. He's going to have one king over them and one prince, which is David. Their king will be Jesus, king of all, king of everything, basically, king of kings, lord of lords. So that's a beautiful thing. All right, chapter 38. With 21 minutes to go. In chapter 38, notice it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed and a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shields and helmets. Gomer and all the troops, the house of Togomar from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your company, that you gather about you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited in the latter years. So we're placing this uh, far ahead from Ezekiel's time, in the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. 
They were brought back out of the nations and now all of them dwell, notice it says, safely, which I meant to put in my notes, so we'll look that up in a minute on the blue letter. All right, so this is interesting. This is a wonderful chapter. Aren't y'all excited? I love this chapter. It's good stuff. What on earth is happening? Well, so first of all, the word of the Lord came, came to Ezekiel. It doesn't say he's necessarily now seeing a vision or, or anything like that or that he's being carried away in the spirit or anything, um, but the word is coming to him. And I think Ezekiel at this point is pretty subdued. He's seen a lot. He's been through a lot. Um, and he's fully trusting in God and God gives him a word and he ain't questioning nothing. He's delivering this word just like God gave it to him. And the word that God gave him is son of man, set your face against God. Now, when we look at God, one of the first things that people do, and again, when they begin to try to interpret scripture is, uh, they immediately want to, you know, a lot of times either spiritualize it. And some people have tried to take this and spiritualize this as just a, a way of God saying that, you know, this is how much I will fight for Israel. Um, but I think that there's too many specifics. We don't interpret scripture that way. We're looking at what God is saying and seeing what does this mean? Um, others have looked at some of the, the names mentioned in here, like Gog and the land of Magog. And what they have done is, in my opinion, um, gotten a little lazy and just tried to tie it to some other war that's mentioned in scripture. Um, and we'll look at that briefly, but I think the, the problem with that is that it doesn't actually match up. For instance, some people like to call this the war that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, in fact, let's look at a little bit of it, if you will. Revelation 20, really quick. We're going to look at some, some scripture. Now, stay with me if you're new to the scripture. I'm going to try to just do this really quick and then we'll finish it. We'll go through the chapter of 38. So we'll get into it in detail. But in Revelation uh, chapter 20, we'll pick it up in verse seven. Verse seven says, now when the thousand years had expired, it's very easy to know what that means, because throughout scripture, we're told that Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. So at the end of the thousand year millennium is what this is. Um, Satan will be released from his prison. Remember, Satan was grabbed a whole love in chapter 19 by one angel and he was bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Y'all remember that? In other words, God took Satan and he put him on reserves. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a park you right here because I, I need to use you one more time. The false prophet and the Antichrist, they are already in the lake of fire. Y'all remember that from the study through the book of Revelation. Okay, so they're in the lake of fire suffering. That's their eternal place. Satan was put in, in temporary holding, if you will. <laughs> and then he was let out at the end of the thousand years. Okay. And it says here, um, and will go out to deceive the nations, which are noticed in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So there's the reference to gather them together to battle though uh, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And notice it says, because we'll reference all of this, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. So he's let out for this little bitty season to cause one final rebellion I believe because so many people who lived during the millennial reign were born during the millennial reign. They never lived as you and I did. They were never tempted and tested by Satan the way we are. So this is their tempting. A few rebel and then he crushes it, it says. And, and so now Satan is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They've been there for a thousand years. Everybody tracking with me? Okay. And they will be tormented day and night. How long? Because that's what the lake of fire is. It's forever. That's why we preach the gospel because we don't want nobody going there. Amen. That's torment forever. Ain't no coming out of there. All right. Ain't no off ramp to the thing. You know, it's just. All right. So we got that war. But because Gog and Magog were mentioned there, there are some people who try to say that this is the same war. Obviously, there are issues. Most of you put, probably pick, picked it apart already um, because there in that war. Satan will gather nations. If you remember, we looked at it from the four corners of the earth to fight. 
and they're fighting the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But here in Ezekiel, where we are, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says that there are eight specific nations that will come from the north only. You follow me? So that it doesn't really match up at all. Not only that, in Ezekiel 39, which we're going to look at in a moment, um, it says that they will be burning the weapons from this war back in Ezekiel for seven years. They're going to burn weapons for seven years. The prophet actually tells us in the millennial reign of Christ, and this is key, because this war that we just looked at in Revelation comes at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Is everybody catching that? Okay. The Ezekiel war, at the end of that war, they're going to burn weapons for seven years. The issue is that the prophets tell us that in the millennial reign of Christ, and you can look at it in Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 65, it says that they... Um, that they will basically do away with their weapons, turning their swords into plowshares. And there will be no war during the millennial reign because Christ ain't having it. You follow what I'm saying? So there are no weapons at the end of the millennium. So that's another issue we have with it. Also, the Revelation 29, uh, which we just looked at, it says that, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Well, in the Ezekiel war that we're going to be looking at, the Bible says that they're going to be, in fact, Ezekiel 39, 12 says, for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying the bodies of those who were destroyed in the Ezekiel war. Well, fire just came down from heaven at the end of millennium and, and, and destroyed all of them. There's nothing to bury. And so you just look at scripture that just doesn't add up. Those are two different wars. We can already see just from looking at a few verses that these are two different wars, Okay. Now, some people, y'all okay? All right, you got to pick it apart. Go back and look at it. Uh, take notes. Go look at it later. Okay. Now, some people think, well, this must be the battle of, the, of, of Armageddon mentioned in Revelation 16 and 19. A lot of people think that this war we're looking at over in Ezekiel is that. Back up now. If you're in Revelation 20, back up a few chapters to Revelation 16. I'm going to read you some verses, and, and you're going to see. That in Revelation chapter 16, we're going to pick it up in verse 12. But what you're going to see is that it is a global war that is happening here in Revelation 16. It's very different from a regional war by eight specific nations mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 that come from the north. So I'm going to start reading verse 12. Y'all okay? 12 through 14 says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up so that the kings from the east might be prepared. Kings from the east not mentioned as part of the Ezekiel war, by the way. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the, of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Notice that the, uh, for they are spirits of demons performing signs. Notice which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, you see to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And so that is a global war. All the kings of the earth are being impacted by that because by now everybody's taking the mark of the beast. Everybody's being controlled by Antichrist. Um, this is a different war. This is a global war happening in the, the, the battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. So that's two, it looks like two different wars happening here. So Ezekiel, and this is good that we pick it apart like this because then it tells us, well, then let's just look at what Ezekiel's talking about and, 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 and not try to match it with something else and just let it speak for itself. The Bible will tell us exactly what's going on. Y'all ready? Okay, good. So let's go back over now um, into Ezekiel 38. There we go. All right, so. Son of man, set your face against Gog. Who's Gog? We're going to try to, try to figure it out a little bit. And then we're going to go. Well, we see Gog of the land, notice, of Magog. And he's called the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And prophesy against him. And I guess I should spend a little bit of time on Gog before I go into to all of this. Because he was mentioned over in Revelation. Y'all remember? So it's real interesting when we look at Gog, and of course the land of Magog is mentioned, which I'll get into in a moment in the book of Genesis with some of these other nations. 
But this figure, Gog, is a prince. And he's a prince over this particular region. Notice he's of the land of Magog. Magog actually means land of Gog. And it says here, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal. So three, three different places, three different geographic regions. He's the prince over those regions, which would either imply that he is a, a man who is like a king, a chief prince over that geographic region, or he's something else. Now, y'all bear with me for a minute. Can I have a little fun? Amen. All right. So people try to figure out who God really is. And there's a couple of different references. I only brought one of them and I'm just having fun. So you can put this in your notes or not. But um, it's interesting that in the, uh, the, the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, okay? It's interesting that in the Septuagint, they translate something that the King James and New King James translates Ahag. They actually translate it Gog, which is very interesting. How many of you remember Balaam's prophecy? Okay, that's like two of you. The Lord knows. Y'all make me do too much work. Y'all remember, okay, Balak hired a false prophet named Balaam to curse Israel. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So, and he was going to do it. The donkey, sh the donkey kept, okay, remember, and the donkey had, God opened the donkey's mouth, and he's like, why are you beating me? I'm a good donkey, right? Okay. All right, now you remember the story. All right. So when he finally gets there, they pay him money. He's going to try to prophesy against Israel, and he opens his mouth and tries to do it, and he can't do it. He blesses them. In fact, over in Numbers 24, which is where it's found, you don't have to turn there, but write it down, Numbers 24. Um, I got to find it. Yeah, Numbers 24, 7. So he opens his mouth to curse Israel. He ends up blessing them. And he's talking about how beautiful their tents are and all this kind of stuff. And he says, he shall pour water from his buckle, bucklets and his seed shall be in many waters. His king, speaking of Israel, his king shall be higher than Ahag and his kingdom shall be exalted. So I, I went and got my Septuagint off the shelf and I went and looked it up just to see that word Ahag that my new King James translates the Septuagint, the Jews translated it Gog. It says that the king shall be higher than Gog. Um, there's also a reference to the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls that has a fragment of that in numbers that's translated. That it seems like the Jews would translate it Gog. Why would they translate it Gog? Well, I don't know, but it seems as though what they're saying is that this Gog figure is, a, is something about this Gog. Well, who is Gog? Well, the interesting thing to me is, well, Ahag, y'all remember, is the king that Saul, the Malachites, was supposed, was supposed to destroy. Y'all remember that? And, and Saul didn't do it. In fact, he brought the king back and some of the sheep and all that kind of stuff. And Samuel showed up like, man, what, well, you were supposed to destroy the sheep. What's wrong with you? And then there's King Ahag. So Samuel took the sword and killed Ahag. How many of you remember that story? Okay, but because Saul didn't do what God told him to do, how many of you know that there were descendants of Ahag that got, that lived, and in the book of Esther, when Haman is about to destroy Israel, we find that he is a descendant of that line that was supposed to be destroyed, and God told Saul to destroy them because they were wicked, and they wanted, check it out, to destroy Israel, which is very interesting to me. So I think from a Jewish perspective, this God figure is, is, is some, some spirit behind this Gog that wants Israel destroyed. That would make Gog a antichrist type figure. Now remember on Sunday, in the book of John, we talked about the fact that the spirit of antichrist has always been in the world. Many antichrists have come, okay? So don't get tripped up by the fact I use that term. Many antichrists have already come. We've seen them in modern times. Hitler was an antichrist, okay? Uh, Pharaoh was an antichrist. Uh, Antichius Epiphanes was an antichrist, um, uh, so forth and so on. Many of them, Herod was an antichrist. You get the picture of what I'm trying to say. They want, Haman was an antichrist. They want Israel destroyed. Why do people want Israel destroyed? Why is there an uh, anti-Semitic spirit within the world? Because Satan is the little God of this world and he wants to destroy God's people. I told you Sunday, there's two groups of people on the earth that Satan wants to destroy. Israel, because of God's love and promises to them 
and the church who is the bride of Christ. He wants us destroyed as well. But thank God, Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. And he's at the right hand of the father interceding. So we're safe. Okay, we're good. We might get some persecution, but we'll never be destroyed because we have eternal life. Okay, we understand that. Now, so then this God fi Gog figure, which is mentioned again in the book of Revelation, I think it's because this Gog figure in my opinion, and this is just Pastor Kevin, and you don't have to believe it, and it's okay. You don't have to put it in your notes, okay? In fact, don't put this in your notes. All right, everybody good? You're, you're going to agree not to put this in your notes? Good. You draw your own conclusion. I believe that Gog is the demonic spirit assigned to the land of Magog who wants Israel destroyed. Now, would that be consistent with any scripture? Well, he's the prince, notice here, of Meshach, and Tubal, and all this kind of area. We see in the book of Daniel, the prince of Greece, the prince of Persia. We know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but principalities and powers and heavenly places. Um, Satan has a very uh, organized principality that's assigned throughout the earth um, with the purpose of destroying the work of God. Um, and, they, and they've been trying to prevent the seed the, the, the prophecy and Genesis of the seed of the woman coming since the beginning. We know all of this stuff, right? Okay. So it could be that God, this figure that seems to stand outside of time a little bit, is also a, a speaking towards this demonic figure that's behind the scene um, and, and that God could be speaking directly even to him. So with all of that said, let's just go back to the text. We good? That's all the fun I'm going to have tonight. All right. So, son of man, set your face against Gog. That's a key. Set your face against. Remember, he was told to set his face against some other things previously. You remember? It implies that Ezekiel knows how to set his face in, in a direction. Set your face against Gog, notice of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against them. Now, there are eight nations that are mentioned here. Now, um, every Bible teacher, prophecy teacher, immediately goes immediately to Russia. Oh, it's Russia. Okay. And that's what we hear all the time. You can, you can get 98 out of a hundred prophecy teachers and they're going to jump to Russia pretty quick. Um, and, and by the way, if you come and you, and you know, I'm not going to disappoint you. I'm not taking Russia off the table. <laughs> I'm just not jumping immediately to Russia. And the reason I'm not is because if I was Ezekiel, I wouldn't know anything about Russia, Europe, I wouldn't know anything about America. I wouldn't know anything about any of those nations if I was Ezekiel 2,500 years ago. You understand what I'm saying? None of that makes sense. I don't have any clue about all of that. So when God is telling Ezekiel, if I was Ezekiel, son of man, set your face against these nations, Ezekiel's thinking something different. Now, when I don't know something or, or if I'm, something happens in my life and something comes up, something is said to me, I think biblically. Um, that's what I do. I always think, well, what does the Bible say? Isn't that what we do? We're trained to do that. What does the Bible say about it? Ezekiel's no different. So Ezekiel would have thought in his mind, hmm, Gog of the land of Magog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, okay, and then jump down a little further, and we, we saw some other nations mentioned there. Of course, we got uh, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. Then verse 6, we got Gomar. Um, and its troops, the house of Togomar, and all of this, and all of these nations which are being mentioned. And if I was Ezekiel, I would be thinking, I have an idea who these nations are because biblically they're described for me all the way back in Genesis chapter 10, these descendants of Noah who are, these are grandchildren of Noah that are being mentioned here. Magog is one of them. Y'all can go look at Genesis 10 in your own time. We got Magog and all of these, Meshach, Tubal. All of these nations were descendants of, I forget which son of Noah, but he only had three. So I could probably, I got 30% chance if I guess, but I won't guess. All right. So these nations were said to have left the area where they were and they began to populate the coastland. So wait a minute, I'm, I'm Ezekiel, so I'm thinking biblically. So I know that Noah and them landed at Mount Ararat, that's Turkey. And we believe that the Noah's Ark is in Turkey today. How many people have seen pictures of what they perceive to be Noah's Ark? In fact, Turkey government won't even let us go look at it anymore. So something's there, okay, all right. 
So the, the ark landed at Mount Ararat, which is in Turkey. Um, and they, they would have gone out from there. Okay, Babel was probably near there. And then eventually they would have gone out. And it says that they would have uh, occupied the coastlands. The coastlands from Turkey is not what we think. It would be the coastlands of the Black and Caspian Sea and then part of the Mediterranean. You follow what I'm saying? So, I mean, Ezekiel has a better idea of what these nations are. So then when you begin to, be, to, to look at these nations and begin to put them on a map, you begin to find out some things that's very interesting. I got several maps here in my notes. Only one was clear enough to put on the screen. You can find hundreds of these, by the way, and they're going to all be slightly different. So Eric's going to put one or, or Andres is going to put one up. So this one kind of gives us, you can't see the whole thing. You see Cush right there at the bottom? Okay. You can't see it, but it's covering the area where Ethiopia is. Well, Ethiopia has always been known to be where Cush went and settled, okay? They were actually called the Cushites at one point, okay? So that tells me that, mm, I'm on the right track. So then, then, then what's going on with the coastlands then, Meshach, Tubal, Mo, uh, uh, Magog, all of this, Rosh, we actually don't fully know. It sounds like Russia, which is why everybody likes to say it's Russia. But here's the reality. Y'all stay with me a moment. Here's the reality. No matter how you put it, and no matter what scholar you are, if you trace these lands, these, these countries, you find yourself in Turkey, going up into Armenia, going up into southern, the southern areas of Europe, which is actually all occupied and controlled by modern day who? Now you can say it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. So by default, Russia's brought into this. The problem is that as you look at, um, if you get into some of the more detailed maps, Meshach, which begins to move a little bit to the west into Europe, Gomar gets way into Europe, Tubal further into to, uh, to Russia, Beth Togomar is a little bit north towards uh, the, the, the center of Russia. The problem is though, when I look at this, and I think about it biblically and then historically, I have an issue because the issue is it expands beyond Russia. So stay with me for a moment. We got a problem. In the news today, the things necessary for this chapter to happen are playing out right now. Um, there's a lot of things happening. You're watching the news. We could get into all of it. But the issue that I have when I look at this map is it's a broader picture than what we think a lot of times. And it goes beyond Russia. The problem I have when I read chapter 38 is there's some bleed over into Europe. and Something's going to happen. You got to stay with me for a moment. So right now, as we go further into this, we find out that these nations are coming to take a, a spoil. We're going to get into this in a moment. The issue right now with all the war that's going on is I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, as this continues, what European nations are going to join? Because the, the problem is, as we've looked at everything, because you got to think about it from this perspective. Ezekiel understands these geographic areas. In Ezekiel's mind, none of this makes sense, though. Why doesn't it make sense? Because these nations that are being mentioned are not really nations to be concerned about. In fact, he, he's like, yeah, God, judge, judge Egypt, judge Babylon in particular. These are the world powers. These are the ones we got to be afraid of. These other nations that you're talking about, and Meshach and Tubal, these, they're not even big enough for us to be concerned about. So why are you even mentioning them? But God knows the beginning from the end. He's the one that could, that could give Nebuchadnezzar an image of something and say, hey, here's how all the world history is going to go. And then it happens just like he said. OK, so because of that, because God is God and we're not, but we're standing on the ground now as, you know, Americans looking at the map and looking at what's going on. And, and we're thinking Russia, Russia, Russia. But the problem right now is that as we see this war developing in Ukraine, if if all of Europe, Russia included, runs out of resources, all of a sudden 
nations that you didn't think that would join with them will flip and join with them and go down to Israel to take all the resources that Israel has because Israel's becoming a powerhouse. And the crazy thing, when you put the map back up, I got another map that I couldn't put up that's better actually. If you look at it and just Google some of these maps, what you can see this one. So you see, you see Ethiopia in, 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 in blue, lighter blue, and Libya in a darker blue, right? You see that, okay? Where look at Egypt. Egypt's not included. That makes sense. Israel and Egypt are working together on the natural gas, um, you know, production and transportation. Okay. Saudi Arabia, not included. They got a lot of oil. So it would seem, as God is saying it, that he already knows how it's going to play out. It could very well be that because Egypt and Saudi Arabia are in the same business. They're all in danger at that point of this invading army that's coming to take a spoil, particularly from Israel, who has the ability to supply all of Europe with nat natural gas. And, they, and, and they're still discovering things. Israel, as we talked about last week, is flourishing and they ain't no bigger than New Jersey. And they're flourishing. It could very well be that nations that we didn't think would flip and invade with Russia or be a part of this thing because we think Russia, 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 but when we get into Meshach, Meshach's over in Europe, y'all. This thing is, is, is a lot different than the way we think about it in modern times. So now let's go back to our text. Now, with all of that in your mind, realizing that Ezekiel would have thought of it biblically as a Jew, and he's thinking, okay, well, these nations are not so much that we need to worry about, but God is looking towards the end. So what we got to do is say, okay, let's watch what's going on and see how this thing plays out because that's how we really get a handle on prophecy. Amen. Because it always, as God shakes it up, there's more to it than what we realize. All right. So notice it says here, prophesy against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. He's against them because they're against his people, I'm sure. In verse 4, so I will turn you around and put hooks in your mouth. Now, what verse 4 is telling us is that when this thing happens, check it out. Remember, we looked at, we looked at this back with Israel when he judged them and split the kingdom. On the ground, what we're going to see is they're coming in to take a spoil. They hate Israel. They want what Israel has. The reality, I told you earlier, whatever plays out on earth, decision was made in heaven. So God is saying, I'm instigating this thing. It's almost like God said, I'm ready to wrap this thing up. So let me go on and get it popping. You know, because, you know, <laughs> y'all a little bit afraid to initiate. So let me help you out so I can wrap up my plans. So he says, I'm going to turn you around, put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen. Now, some, some Bible scholars now are saying that, you know, the potential for horses to be used because we don't fight with horses anymore could be the fact that there's, there's been a war that's happened that's taken resources off the table. I don't necessarily know if that's the case, but it could be. We could literally see horses again, um, but it could be also that Ezekiel didn't have any other way to describe what God was saying to him other than to use the type of technology that he understood. Make sense? Um, they didn't have tanks. They didn't have, they had chariots, but they were driven by what? Horses. Okay. So it could be either one of those and either one of those are on the table. Okay. And I'm good with it because I want to see it unfold. I don't want to be able to say, I know exactly what it's going to be. I want to see how God's going to do it. Okay. So I'm open to all of that. All right. All splendidly clothed. So they decked out. They got good uniforms on. They got a lot of good gear is what that is. And great company with bucklers and shields. All of them handling swords. So in other words, they are, they are thoroughly equipped on their way into Israel. Now, here's some nations we understand. Persia, which is modern day Iran, Ethiopia and Libya, these nations we talk about, are with them, all of them with shields and helmets. And the interesting thing even today is that Iran is helping Russia with technology in uh, Ukraine, basically helping Russia kill Ukrainians, they're tied together. Russia is parked in Syria right above the Golan Heights of Israel. So they are, they are there. So all of this stuff is kind of already happened. So Iran, Russia working closely together, 
Russia's already down in the northern parts of Israel. Uh, Putin is a very sick man, so he's already looking at what he wants to take probably right now. And he's, just, he's, he's got his chest board and he's, he's thinking through what he's going to do. So these things are very, very, um, how can I say it, lined up. And God could do this at any point. Understand what we just read. We look at news like we're trying to see things line up. The reality of what we just read is it's going to happen once God says, okay, now's the time. Does everybody understand that? So as Christians, we have to think like that. A lot of Bible prophecies are scrambling. Prophet, uh, uh, Bible prophecy gurus are scrambling and they're trying, to, they're trying to, you know, keep up with it all. And yeah, we want to keep up with it. But when it happens, it's going to be because God says now. And he's put the hooks in their jaws and bring them in. Okay, so we understand that. Now, I do believe, well, I'll get into that later on. All right. Now, so it says, um, Go, uh, Gomar, I believe I'm in verse six, and all the troops, the house of Togomar, and, and that goes a little further up, actually. Let me pull my map back up. Um, so when we get into, I'm sorry, y'all, I got too many maps. So when we get into Gomar in verse six, Gomar, we believe, and most scholars, I would say, put it and this is interesting, as far up potentially as Germany and Poland, um, Togomar is far up as, and now scholars are divided. Some of them have it in Turkey, others have it up way up in, in, in Russia. So there is some speculation. Scholars are divided over some of these, but most of them have Gomar in Europe. Um, from the far north, now, I'm glad that um, we're, we're jumping in, I'm sorry. Yeah, from the far north, verse six, and all the troops, many people with him. Now, when it says from the far north, here's what you can do. You take any map, just get on Google Maps and put your finger on uh, Jerusalem, okay? And then you draw straight north. And when you do that, far north, where do you land? Anybody know? Okay. Y'all don't look at y'all maps and stuff? Am I the only person that likes maps? I love, I, I'm always in maps. All right, so draw a line from Jerusalem straight up. You, you do end up far north. You're in Russia at that point. You fall right in the heart of the capital of Russia if you go straight north from Israel. So another reason why a lot of scholars are tying Russia into all of this stuff. And so um, I just didn't want to jump on that bandwagon. You got to look at the text and figure out, well, what does the Bible say about all of these places? Um, Russia does fall in the mix just because of what it says here in the scripture. All right, y'all good? Verse seven, prepare yourself and be ready. Oh, I'm way over time. <laughs> prepare yourself and be ready. You and all your company that are gathered about you and be a guard for them. Because after many days, now this, this puts it in the latter time. So this would not take place um, for a while, and we're 2,500 years into the future from when Ezekiel was delivering this. Because it says here, in the latter years, which usually speaks of the, the latter times of Bible prophecy, which we're living in, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples, 1948, um, on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. Remember, we talked about that. And they were brought back out of the land, uh, excuse me, out of the nations. And now all of them dwell safely. And uh, I'll end on this note. Y'all give me one, one minute. Can I have a minute? Yes. All right. I want to pull this up because I didn't put it in my notes. So School of Ministry folks, I'm grabbing my, uh, my blue letter Bible. And I just want to look up really quick. Thank you all for bearing with me. At the end of verse 8, I believe it is. All right. Bata is the word. Um, I wanted to look that word up safely because, you know, when I read through this, a lot of times I have issues with that word. Because when I think about Israel, I'm thinking, well, this must be way off into the future because I keep seeing missiles flying out of uh, the Gaza Strip all the time towards Israel and Iran is always threatening. <laughs> so in my estimation, they ain't dwelling safely yet, you know. Um, but, you know, 
it was pointed out, and I have to confirm everything, the Hebrew word here, bata, and it's interesting because it, it means dwelling boldly. It can mean dwelling confidently. And I would say that describes Israel, especially when you let Netanyahu tell it. And they're sitting behind the Iron Dome, and they ain't really backing down from anybody. If you notice, this is a tiny little nation, and they're like, well, we're going to defend ourselves. And, hey, you know, and they're saying, look, Iran, you know, we're going to blow some stuff up. And I don't know if you've noticed over the last few years, they have blown up some stuff in Syria to prevent weapons traffic, uh, trafficking coming through between Iran. They, they've blown up some drones. I mean, Israel is not like, they're not being a punk, basically, is what I'm saying. They're blowing stuff up. They're confident. That's what I'm trying to say. They're confident and they're bold. And so that's really what the word is implying. So with that being said, they're dwelling boldly. And, and, they're, they're, they, and look, they've been at peace with Russia f- to some degree for a long time, but they see that's going away and they're not backing down with their plans to provide natural gas to Europe and do other things. And they're developing technology. They have technology that the nations around them don't even know they have and understand. Um, they have the ability to destroy anybody that approaches them. Um, but they just, they are a little na- nation and the Iron Dome won't hold up to everything. Eventually it got to fall, but they are bold and confident in their stance right now. So I think that when I look at this, this is describing them where they are and where they're headed. And so when we come back together, we'll pick it up in verse nine and we'll begin to talk about, okay, so what does this look like? And maybe even some timing of when this might happen is at least some, some speculation as we have fun with the, with the text. But ultimately, this is a beautiful passage of scripture. We see these things shaping up, which just tells us that, you know, God is sovereign. He sees everything from the beginning to the end. What we've learned tonight, though, in my opinion, is that the decisions are made in heaven. So when we view the world, we've got to begin to view the world from a biblical perspective, if you will, in that. We can pray and trust the Lord no matter what we're seeing because we understand that he's sovereign over all of these things, okay? And even the things that we're seeing that are happening in our nation right now has a demonic overtone or undertone. I don't know which one is the way to say it. With the sexual immorality that's sweeping our country. Um, And you people in the room who are older I mean, you've been living longer than a lot of the ones here younger. And you, I mean, when I talk to y'all, I mean, you've never seen it like this. The world is interesting right now. We're living in prophetic times. All right, let's close. Father, thank you for tonight, for allowing us to gather, for allowing us to enjoy what you have given us in your word and and letting it strengthen our faith in you and, and our trust in you, Lord God. And our understanding of just how much in control you are when it looks like chaos down here. Uh, Lord, you are in complete control of it. Um, and Lord, we're thanking you for that. Lord, I thank you that we have this promise, this hope, Lord, uh, this living hope that you've given us of eternity. Um, your plans for us are secure. Those who be- of us who belong to you, Lord, you won't lose any of us. Our salvation is secure. We thank you for that. Um, So, Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we prepare to go out of this place through the rest of this week, Lord. Um, Wherever it is that we have to go, as you've called us to occupy until you come, keep us, strengthen us. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.